and this says engaging non-traditional audiences on Mongolia, the educational outreach programs of the American Center for Mongolian Studies, uh, presented by the current executive director, Jonathan Adelton, as well as the former executive director, Charles Kruskov. So thank you very much. So thank you very much. I'll take about 10 minutes to talk about uh, some of the broader programs, and then Charles will talk about a, what we consider to be a very exciting uh, new initiative that's going to bring dozens of American students uh, and others faculty as well uh, to Mongolia over the next, um, the next three years. Uh, in terms of uh, KORC, I guess I'll start with a shout out. Um, I retired a couple of years ago from the Foreign Service after a 32-year uh, career. Um, the, the executive director is sort of part-time thing back in the States. The, overwhelmingly, the center of gravity of our organization is in Mongolia, is in Ulaanbaatar, where we have that center, where we have the lecture series, where we have the fellowships and things like that. But when I look back at my career, uh, 10 countries, 30 years, that's pretty much par for the course. In seven of those countries, they had KORC centers. And uh, just to, uh, some of them are represented here today, uh, Yemen, Pakistan, India, Afghanistan, Cambodia, Jordan, and Mongolia. Uh, and to a greater or lesser extent, in every one of those countries, they also kind of reached out to the expatriate community, and so we had some involvement in some way or another. Uh, and some of these ones, I guess you have to be in the Carrick, uh, the Carrick circle to know some of them, but uh, Dan Verisco, I don't know if you guys know him, but I knew him back in the 80s in Yemen, when he was a young guy out of a small college in the Midwest has become a wonderful anthropologist, written lots of books, and is still involved in, uh, as far as I know, in KORC, in fact, in the Yemen Center as well. Uh, certainly, Jordan, I think, is one of the um, old standing ones, uh, you know, wonderful facilities. As an aid officer, we provided some support, including the endowment, including the facilities where they kept people over the summer. Again, Pierre Bakai, among other things, talking about young people, he took uh, Chelsea Clinton around uh, Jordan when uh, she was a student at Sanford, uh, when her mother was visiting at one point. Um, but certainly the Jordan one, I mean, we're one of the newer ones, uh, uh, the Mongolia Center. Uh, Jordan is one of, sort of the granddaddies that's been around for a long time and you know, has a huge impact. Um, and uh, I think about Pakistan as well. I don't know uh, Peter Dodd from a few years ago, but certainly I'm on the list of alumni of the Pakistan Center. Um, and again, I guess just my story, it was, uh, uh, you know, got to Pakistan, uh, did my dissertation research there, uh, did my dissertation, which was published by Oxford University Press, on migration, uh, and then launched my my 32-year foreign service career. Uh, you know, they ended up in being U.S. ambassador to Mongolia. Did come back actually to Pakistan after the earthquake, and you know, the language skills, the ability to familiarize with Pakistan, all that came together in a very, very uh, you know positive way, and all in all kinds of things. Um, and again, I guess uh, just looking on to the uh, Mongolia Center. Actually, I've served twice in Mongolia, in the, first as a sort of a more mid-level officer and coming back uh, a few years later. Um, but the, the KRC was just being, I mean, ACMS was just being founded that, uh, when I was leaving the first time. Uh, when I came back as ambassador, I did engage, did give a lecture actually at ACMS, um, did host for KORC, uh, which I, I, you know, maybe they make us feel good, but they think that that Mongolian uh, uh, meeting we organized for all the for all the directors of all the centers around the world was a real highlight because it's really is true that uh, when people visit Mongolia, it's just an amazing thing to see. I will pass around the uh, little postcards afterwards, have them there if you want to put it in your fridge. I sort of challenge people to look at that picture of the horses at the step at sunset and not want to go to Mongolia because it's, uh, it's a pretty spectacular thing. Uh, with some of the stuff we do is on a smaller scale of what was talked about before. Um, our funding basically comes from uh, NEH sometimes. Um, uh, from uh, state, for Department of State, Department of Education, and also, of course, we see private donations, uh, and what Charles will talk about is Luce Foundation funded, which is a wonderful and exciting program. Uh, we have six, seven, eight scholarships a year, research scholarships over the years, over 10 years, or something, talking about 80 people. We've been around for 15, so probably more than 100 fellows over that period of time, uh, and they really do make a big impact. We have the regular lecture series. Uh, we have the YouTube channel. Uh, if someone's teaching Mongolia or East Asia, you could actually access them for your your own class. You could um, uh, access one of those. We've got everything from um, hip hop in Mongolia, a recent lecture, uh, the importance of hip hop in Mongolia, to a lot of archaeological stuff as well. And the quality's improved over time, so this is a kind of outreach as well. Um, we do, do Mongolian language courses uh, as well. Again, sort of amazed at the India, the massive scale of it. Uh, but we do do uh, a summer course, we do do online. Our uh, language teacher gets grave reviews, uh, she does things. Um, through Skype, uh, and so that's sort of a de developing program. But the thing I guess I wanted to talk about most quickly, and I will do it, is simply the different kinds of outreach in different kinds of ways. Uh, certainly, we do program, uh, and we welcome sort of interactions and with other universities that have a group coming out. 
Uh, we've done this with uh, UPenn with a lottery program, I think it's three years in a row. Um, it gets good, good comments, I think. Uh, I don't know if you were on that, but I mean, uh, uh, David Detman, sometimes Professor Atwood participates, and uh, very excited about that. I think, um, uh, well, I mean, that's one example of our program. We did it for a program that University of California, Berkeley arranged. Uh, recently, we had a group of, of Bryn Mawr students. Uh, we have an unusual one, which kind of fits because ACMS is gonna help out, uh, but it's Mercer University where I'm a, an adjunct, um, and it kind of touched on some of these things because basically this summer I'm gonna take a, my wife's also here, we're gonna go together with a former Peace Corps volunteer in Mongolia who is a Mercer graduate and is now a PhD student in Florida. And basically it's more a service trip than an academic one. Although before we go, we'll have a two week uh, course on Mongolia um, and uh, the students will get credit for it. It's amazing because actually this is 100% 100 paid for by the university. If you're enrolled, you get credit, you get the air ticket, you get everything that we do. Uh, so we'll have two weeks in Mongolia, uh, I'm sorry, two weeks in, at Mercer, and then three weeks in Mongolia on a service project, basically worked out through a Mongolian NGO called Children of the Peak, and it's with the children and families who uh, basically scavenge in the dumps outside town. Uh, so again, maybe somewhat non-traditional. Um, I do believe this is gonna be the most diverse group uh, to ever go from uh, any, any university, any college, uh, going to um, Mongolia. I mean, it's gonna kind of be interesting when you walk around the downtown, um, uh, downtown Mombatra because it's a very diverse group. And so it's sort of nice to, uh, nice to see that. I guess the, the last thing, uh, maybe I'll end up before turning it over to Charles, is simply another one I think is created, because I think in the Mercer group, by the way, for most people, this will be their first overseas experience. They've never gone before, excited about Mongolia. I think it will be terrific in that respect. Uh, one of the things that we've been involved in for, I think this is going to be the third or fourth term in a row, ROTC has something called a, a, a Cultural Awareness Program, Reserves Officer Training uh, Corps. Again, many of these students come from less well-known. I mean, a lot of our fellowships, you can list off the places where they come from and they're well-known, but a lot of them aren't. And I think that these, uh, KORC, I think ACMS, gives people a chance for that first experience. ROTC, I didn't talk to everybody, but everyone I talked to, yeah, this is my first time overseas. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was amazing, you know, again, a fairly diverse group, um, but we scheduled their program, we did a trip to the Gobi Desert for them, uh, and these are life-changing experiences. I, you know, I mentioned I started with my own sort of personal story. Charles actually has a very similar one, um, but in terms of, uh, you know, part of the care um, umbrella is hugely important for us. We learn from other institutions, um, but also, uh, you know, going for the SLUS program that he'll talk about is a, is a wonderful opportunity for a country like um, Mongolia to have what, we're gonna have 50 or, 50 or 60, uh, or 40 or 50 American students this summer, and maybe more in subsequent summers. Thank you, Jonathan, and uh, it's, it's, it's great to have uh, such an esteemed uh, executive director. I was the, the founder of the ACMS uh, more than 18 years ago at AAS. We were, we were formed and, and 17 years ago established, and 15 years we've been, uh, now had our center in Ulaanbaatar. And uh, I have had the privilege of visiting uh, the India Center, the, the Cambodia Center, and several of the other KOX centers over the years, and are very helpful in terms of forming our center. It's a little uh, overwhelming when you visit a place like the India Center and the size and scope, and just remember that India has uh, 1.3 billion more people than Mongolia, uh, 3 million people, the least densely populated country in the world. And so when we started this, and I came and met with Mary Ellen Lane, uh, to talk about creating a Mongolia study center and the reaction we always get from people is, does anyone study Mongolia? Like, what's going on in Mongolia? Is it big enough? And it's true, the field of Mongolian studies is extremely small. And so from the beginning, our center was established to say, anyone who's doing anything and studying about Mongolia is part of what we would define as Mongolian studies. Mongolian studies as a traditional field is thought of as linguistics, history, a fairly narrow definition. I don't come from a Mongolian studies background. I did a bit of China studies, uh, saw the lights, uh, saw the clean air and wide spaces of Mongolia, and moved north as many scholars, and actually we're getting a wave of uh, oh, particularly scholars of Western China uh, coming to Mongolia now because uh, it's, it's, of course, the environment is much more open to do research, to do studies in Mongolia. And then I've taken student groups to China to, I just came back uh, last week from Japan and China with a student group uh, and taking students to Mongolia as well. And there's no comparison to me. In Mongolia, because it's a small country, the access you get and interdisciplinarity. So I'm actually, my field is economics and business, but 
I, through the center, and then just being in Mongolia in a small place, you meet the anthropologists, the archaeologists, the sociologists, the political science people. Everyone comes together because it's a small group of people, and there's much more sharing uh, of ideas and, and information, and has led to some interesting things. We, we helped introduce some historians with a group of tree ring researchers from uh, Columbia University's Lamont Doherty lab, and they started to figure out that they have a, a, a couple of thousand year record of climate in Mongolia, and they could compare this to the rise of the Mongols, Genghis Khan, conquering. So uh, those were very good, wet, warm years in Mongolia, which was meant that people had the luxury in a way of going out and conquering all of their neighbors. Uh, so this is something we do remind our, our neighbors in uh, China, the former Mongolian territories, uh, south of us in China and, and north of us in Russia. Uh, so Mongolia, of course, has big visions, and our center has always had big visions, and I say from the beginning, really uh, emphasized, we want to work with, with everyone. We don't have the luxury of having kind of a small group and a traditional group of, of scholars and a lot of people coming through PhD programs. But what I discovered over time is that there was a huge number of people doing studies in Mongolia and no one identifies themselves as Mongolian studies specialists. And so uh, the amount of research work, and when we start looking at the statistics of the number of visitors we would have compared to other centers, I mean, we would have several hundred American visitors in a year to our, our center, and the amount of dissertations and other work going on was, was quite incredible across the range of whether that's science and people working on climate change, earthquake studies, uh, wildlife studies, etc. You know, this, this very wide range of, of different fields. Um, and I think that's been an important sort of ethos of the center from the beginning. So we've hosted groups, many, many groups, and I'll, I'll say the ROTC, uh, if you don't know, so that's uh, because Mongolia is very involved with peacekeeping and training with the US military. And it has been something, and I think it's something that a lot of times, and sometimes as academics, we think, uh, you know, should we be associating and, and working with the military? But one, the military has money, and they have a lot of money to support these programs, and they have a great interest in this cultural engagement because particularly through a field like peacekeeping, but even in other operations, you know, they need to understand the cultures better. And I know a number of the centers have worked closely uh, in different ways uh, on that. But so the, for the ROTC, we've been offering this sort of cultural addition when they come out to do peacekeeping training with the Mongolian uh, troops. We've worked with the Luce Foundation, has been a very key funding partner of ours over the years. We've had three different grants with the Luce Foundation. So, the goal of the Luce Foundation, I worked before with the Freeman Foundation uh, as well, to take students to Mongolia. And to me, to summarize what I understand is to get Americans more knowledge about Asia. How do we get Americans to Asia uh, to learn more? How do we build those bridges back so that uh, Asian scholars come and are able to interact with people in the, in the US? And I'll mention that, so I teach at a Canadian university, uh, so I put the north in the uh, Georg, uh, so it's the North American uh, centers, uh, including Canada. And unfortunately, our US government money, we can only sponsor US uh, citizens, but uh, through the Luce Foundation, which primarily focuses on Americans, we've been able to include some Canadians uh, in our programs. But so we were talking with them about how to develop a program that's a bit broader based. And we've hosted different groups from different universities and organizations over the years. But I wanted to create, and I've been running field schools in different ways, uh, and, and thought of this idea of doing a field school in Mongolia. And so we've been scrambling for the past year. We got a grant, a multi-year grant from the Luce Foundation that helps cover some of the operational costs and fellowships, because we see the cost barriers as being one of the big, big barriers. On the other hand, uh, so our program is $2,900 for an 18-day uh, program in Mongolia, Ulaanbaatar to Ulaanbaatar. So we cover all the costs, uh, meals, hotels, in Mongolia tents, uh, and uh, the transportation and, and all the visits and things while we're there on site. So we've been kind of scrambling this year to pull together uh, and if you create one of these programs, you realize you have to create. Someone has to write the terms and conditions, write all the application materials, set all that up, get everything going, advertise it. We tried to put it out through different ways, and this is something I think we all should talk more about, how we can effectively reach our audiences. I teach in a business school, and marketing is a very important piece of making these, these programs work. 
I will say that we have the privilege that Mongolia actually sells quite well because it's a place that most people have heard of. They have some imagination of maybe Genghis Khan and maybe grasslands. Uh, and it seems exotic, but it's not so dangerous so far, so uh, 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 difficult a place to get to. You can go through Beijing, you can go through Seoul uh, to fly there fairly easily. Um, so we put it out there and we weren't sure. I don't know the other centers and, and people when you experience this, like in our field research fellowships, February 15th deadline, uh, we might get one application before February 14th, uh, and then we get all of our applications the day uh, on the deadline. And so we put this out there. This is the first year we're running this. We put it up there February 15th as the priority deadline, and April 30th as our final deadline, so we give ourselves some time. We need to make another big push. In December, we already had five applications. You know, in early January, we had 10. Uh, these are coming in. By February 15th, we had 70-something applications. Uh, for our program. And we're like, wow, <laughs> okay, we've got something here. People seem really interested in this. And we took the, the point of view, I actually teach at an institution that's focused on adult learners, and uh, I believe in lifelong learning. And so we took the idea from the beginning that this is not a program aimed at any one target group, although undergraduates, of course, are probably gonna be the largest audience. And that's what we see, about 50% of our applicants being undergraduates. Um, another 25% being graduate students, uh, and 25% being teachers and people in the community. So we're, 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 we're seeing a diversity in the applications. We're gonna learn one of the things we're talking about. We'll learn more this summer, should we have separate streams or separate programs for different groups. And we've done three different tracks. Uh, one is in archeology, span led by Julia Clark, who's worked with us for a long time and who does field archeology. span um, another one that I'm leading is on renewable energy. Uh, and then the third one is on migration. And so interestingly, the migration topic was the most popular topic. Unfortunately, my renewable energy was the least uh, popular. But so we had uh, 12 people, and then we're asking people if they will, and we ask them in their application, would you be willing to take a different stream? And so we're gonna move, migrate, I guess, some of the migration people over to the uh, energy. <coughs> So we're gonna have about 15 international students, mostly Americans, uh, have a few Canadians coming as well, and uh, Europe, I just taught, came back from teaching in Europe for a year, I think there's a, be a European audience for this as well. Um, and then uh, we work with, in advertising, I think we, we've done some things with like Asia Network, which is, I used to teach in a liberal arts college, it's a very important network of the, of the liberal arts colleges uh, doing Asia work. Um, and then, um, in the future, I think we can expand out and maybe have five or six different streams. Uh, and we're having uh, at least five Mongolian students. We're reserving places, and then we're waiving tuition costs for Mongolian students and actually paying them a small stipend because for in-country students, uh, they want to work in the summer. And so that's an important component, and that's where it's support from the Luce Foundation. Looking forward, we have the luxury that we can do this for two or three or four years with Luce Foundation support. And then we we'll make it a tuition-driven part of one of the key fundraising tools for the center. Uh, if we can keep up our numbers, then you can generate $100,000, $150,000 uh, to keep the program uh, really going as one of our key uh, funding pieces for the, the center. So my own ethos is get people on the ground, you know, get people out there, they have their experience, and then they'll find their way. And we see this in our other programs. Uh, students who do study abroad come back later as grad students and, and, and other ways. So that's the idea, is this is kind of a taster. We're focusing on people who have never been to Mongolia before, um, and some people with some experience, but getting them to, to broaden out. So the, the, our field school, I'd say, you know, is, seems to have hit a nerve and, and worked well, and be interested to talk to some of the other centers. And I know some are very established programs, but I think we can think about wider audiences as well. Uh, for some of our programs. Well, and I'll just mention finally, uh, one of the things, I'm taking my family, my kids out, and I think they'd be interested in a family program. And so we, we decided not to do high school students, I think there's some challenges, but parents and kids of a certain age, uh, as a camp sort of idea, but with an academic focus, um, I think would be one that would have uh, interest and would then bring you a new audience as well. So, thank you. Thank you.